this session is about deep learning and economics. Um, this session is one of the two professional development sessions that we had at the conference, along with the publishing and economics. Um, and our goal with these is to give you information that can be um, hopefully useful um, in your own research. And so I'm not going to be so much talking about papers and economics that use deep learning as providing an introduction to methods and tools um, that you may be able to use uh, directly in your own work. Um, obviously, we don't have a huge amount of time, um, so it's going to be a pretty uh, surface level discussion, but I'll also point you to lots of additional resources. All right. Um, so deep learning over the past decade has revolutionized the processing of unstructured data. By unstructured, I mean data like text, images, audio, video. Um, and this has in turn transformed a variety of disciplines, you know, ranging from things like allowing NASA to, to land a rover on very rugged Martian terrain to changing how doctors diagnose disease. Um, and it's done this by essentially giving um, practitioners a way to take unstructured data and turn it into uh, representations, vectors that can be used to power downstream analyses. So you take your unstructured data, which you can't really do computations on, and you turn it into data that you can do computations with that's useful for whatever task you have at hand. Um, and I think that now we're really um, at the cusp of a deep learning revolution in economics. Just even in the past year, there's been a huge increase in the number of people using it. And I think it has a similar potential to really uh, transform economic analyses. Um, so uh, massive quantities of non-computable data could power economic analyses if they were converted into a computable format. So let me just give a few examples. Uh, libraries and archives have scanned literally billions of pages of historical documents, um, including archives you know, in the developing world. In the US, the National Archives has scanned 14 billion pages, but those are in image scans. You can't take an image scan of a table and import that into R and run regressions. There's processing that needs to be done to make that data usable. Data can also be tracked in other types of images, like uh, satellite images and aerial photography, which are also vast. Uh, text contains massive amounts of unstructured information. Uh, same thing for audio and video. And while these types of raw information are very different, one of the really just remarkable, astounding things about deep learning is that the deep learning methods used to convert them to computable information are often quite related down to drawing on the same neural network architecture. And so if you make an investment in say learning how to process text with deep learning and later you wanna process images, you'll be in a pretty good position to understand that literature too, which would not have been true a decade ago. Uh, these literatures were highly specialized. You need a lot of very specific domain knowledge about the grammar of the particular sub-Saharan African language that you wanted to study. And you could spend your whole life gaining that knowledge and engineering rules to do that. Um, with deep learning, it's incredibly general. Um, and so we as economists and more generally uh, have two different approaches to processing unstructured data. We can write a set of instructions that tells the computer how to process the data. And we do that by defining a set of rules. And so for example, if we had tables that we would like to digitize, we'd like to uh, detect the layouts in them, we could tell the computer to, to look for connected white pixels, which would indicate a uh, space between columns or rows in the table. So we specifically give a specific rule to the computer that tells it how to process the data. Um, in contrast, we could learn how to process the data by giving the computer empirical examples um, using deep learning. And so for the example I gave, you would uh, give uh, the computer um, tables where their layouts had been annotated and it would learn from those examples um, how uh, to detect the layouts of the tables that you're interested in. So rule-based approaches have the advantage of being easy to understand. Um, Many of us are used to interact with computers via rules. We tell it what to do, and then it does it, hopefully. Um, they have their place, um, but they often perform poorly um, in both uh, computer vision tasks and natural language processing applications. And in short, the reason for this is that complexity and noise are the enemy of rules. 
um, and unstructured data uh, tend to be rife with complexity and noise. And so you would like to process some tables and you write a rule that you think will do it, but it turns out that the, uh, the book was a little bit skewed when you put it on the scanner. Um, and that's gonna throw with your rules. So then you're gonna have to write an exception to your rule. And also the lighting conditions may have varied and that's another exception. But then once you write exceptions to the rules, you realize that there's actually exceptions to exceptions to the exceptions and you go down this entire rabbit hole of making some very complicated pipeline that maybe, maybe it does okay on your document of interest, but it's not gonna to apply to any other document because it's been very heavily engineered um, to what you're looking at. And this is also true um, with text. Um, the English language is remarkably complex. There's many different ways to say the same thing, and yet the same word can have very different meanings depending on its context. And so if you're using a rule, like say a keyword to measure something, um, you know, that's gonna be very, um, <laughs> Uh, very coarse, um, and you might have to engineer a bunch of rules to try to account for that. All right, so what deep learning does is to learn a robust mapping between your input, your unstructured data, and the desired output. Um, and so you can think of deep learning as an incredibly powerful universal function approximator. So in many economic applications, um, the inputs are unstructured data like images. And so your inputs would be the X coordinate, Y coordinate, and RGB value uh, of the pixels in the image, or it might be uh, text. Um, and the output uh, is often some high dimensional dense vector representations that are going to power your downstream analyses. And this will make more sense, I think, as I give you some examples. Uh, so why do we call it deep learning? Well, the deep comes from the many layers in the neural network that's used to map inputs into outputs. Um, these models typically entail tens of millions to tens of billions of learned parameters. Okay, so you might be asking, well, how is this feasible? Uh, how do we have enough data to estimate deep models? Uh, fortunately, uh, we would rarely, as economists, train a deep learning model completely from scratch. Um, you know, this is something that you might do if you're a Google or Facebook or OpenAI, and it can actually cost millions of dollars. Um, but instead, what we do is to use transfer learning to leverage pre-trained models, often trained with self-supervised methods. Um, by entities with a lot of money and compute using massive data sets and, um, and then we can use those. So to give an example, like the way you would train a large language model or one way you would train a large language model, take a snapshot of like all the text on the internet, uh, randomly mask out 15% of words and then train your model to predict those words. And that's uh, basically how it works. Um, and that's probably gonna put you out a couple million dollars of compute. Um, you're very unlikely, you know, or basically you're not going to do that as an academic. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, Google did that. They put the model online. Um, and the model already understands kind of how language works. You don't need to start from scratch. You just need to tune it to your specific application, but the model already has an understanding of language um, from its massive scale pre-training. Um, methods to optimize deep models. Um, I'm not gonna be able to go into that in this lecture. I wanna give you an intuition for a few key things. Um, on my website, I have a knowledge base um, that I built for my PhD course. Um, and it has a bunch of different topics in deep learning. It links to various web resources from very introductory um, to, to more um, advanced resources for people who already have a fair bit of exposure to deep learning um, and also includes lecture notes and lecture videos. Um, and so, you know, in the class, we talk a lot about how you would optimize these models. Um, but uh, we, we won't have a time to uh, get into that in this brief lecture because I really want to introduce you guys to packages and, and, and what you can do with them. All right, so computing has a long history in economics and I think that you can argue that the advent of personal computing in the 1990s really revolutionized the discipline. Like it's actually pretty hard to, I, I, or I would say, I don't think it's an accident that the rise of development economics happens around the same time as the rise of personal computing. You know, development economics tends to be a very empirical uh, field. Like if you wanna go out and collect data in the field, it would, you would be more hard pressed to do that 
without like a laptop or personal computer, I'm sure as anybody who has worked in the field knows. And so it really kind of transformed what we could study as economists by virtue of having personal computing. And I think that today advances in GPU compute and the availability of cheap cloud compute, again, have the potential to transform the types of data and the questions that we as economists can study. All right. Um, and so broadly speaking, a deep learning transforms the ability to process unstructured economic data in two ways. We can unlock traditional sources. So things like tables, uh, census data that economists have long worked with. Um, we can unlock data that would never have been feasible to digitize manually. We can do that with automation through deep learning and we can do it hopefully in a very accurate way. Um, secondly, it can change the types of information that can be converted into structured data that we can analyze. Um, and so for example, deep learning makes it possible to measure different features of text, like large scale text databases, millions, billions of pieces of text um, in an automated way. Um, and so today I'm going to provide an example of each of these types of applications. Um, but first I'd like to give a brief introduction to deep learning. Um, and so again, I'm not really going to be able to convey any of the technical details or give anybody much of an understanding of what these models are doing on, under the hood. Um, but I do just want to introduce a few uh, key points. Um, you know, I think it's, and you'll see this come through, I think it is important that it, as economists, that if we're gonna use deep learning models, we need to understand what they're doing. And I've been in this debate various times with people who disagree. And so you can't possibly tell me I need to go learn another thing. Um, but just as it's important uh, to understand, not just how to use the regression command in Stata, but to actually know what a regression is and what it's doing and how it works. Um, it's important to have some understanding of what deep learning is doing under the hood. And I think, and you'll see this come through that this is, I think, particularly true for development economists um, because most off the shelf deep learning technologies that you can just take and use without understanding how they work at all, um, they tend to be focused on kind of high resource commercial applications um, because they were created by private companies who needed a commercial incentive um, uh, to develop them. As development economists, oftentimes we're working with very low resource languages. Um, you know, we're working in settings that are not representative of the main commercial objectives of Amazon um, or Google. And you'll see some examples where what was available just didn't work, but actually by understanding what these models were doing, it was pretty realistic to tune it uh, to our setting. So I don't think as development economists, we need to at all give up on deep learning for processing our data, but we may be somewhat more likely to actually need to understand what's going on um, and so that we can tune things to our own settings. Um, and so the knowledge base on my website compiles many different resources of varying levels of technicality. Um, last year at the AAA meetings, I gave continuing education lectures. They're on the AAA website. Um, and those also provide a fairly concise introduction that gives some intuition for the technical details um, targeted towards economists. Of course, there's many resources online about deep learning, um, uh, some much better than what I could ever put together and you'll find those linked on my website. Okay, um, and so I'm gonna give that brief introduction. I'm gonna talk about processing traditional data sources at scale, creating novel types of data. And finally, I'm also gonna say a bit about solving computational problems. And so I've had several people come up to me at this conference and say, why aren't there more macro papers here? And I don't think that reflects us being biased against them in the submission process. We just didn't receive um, many submissions in that field. But like, I think this using these methods to solve computational problems is of particular interest, uh, maybe to all of us. Um, but I particularly have some macroeconomic students who are really interested in this. And so I'm going to talk about that very briefly as well. Um, so a brief introduction uh, to deep learning. Uh, what is a neural network? Um, the first thing I'm gonna say is that this is a question 
of enormous interest to many people out there. And as a result, there are some just phenomenal introductions to neural networks um, because somebody can spend nine months of their life making a short YouTube video series and make enough money off of that to make it worth their while, right? Because there is so much interest. And so um, I want to, in particular, for anybody who does not have uh, knowledge of what a neural network is, or even if you do and you want to review, um, go to YouTube, uh, look for three blue, one brown, um, which is a video series by Grant Sanderson. It's a phenomenal graphical introduction um, to deep learning. Um, and it's, it's, it's just way better <laughs> than anything I could ever do. But I'm going to, to kind of say in words, a general intuition for what a neural network does. And so in the case of this network shown here, you see um, an image of the number nine. So suppose our goal is to um, take images of digits and classify which digit they are. And this is kind of like the classic um, deep learning task. And so, well, what is that image? You can think of that image um, as being um, uh, 784 pixels. And so I'll show that here. It's a 28 by 28 image, so pretty low resolution. Um, and each of those pixels holds a value. And so those pixels are going to be the input to your neural network. And then you're gonna pass it through the neural network. And your goal, your output is to predict a number for each of the nine possible digits that it can be. And you're gonna classify it as the number that receives the highest score. Um, and so what exactly are you doing there to get from those pixel inputs to a number for each digit that it could be? Um, and so in short, a neural network consists of layers of interconnected nodes, which are called neurons and each neuron holds a value, right? So it holds a value from one of these pixels in the image. Um, and neurons are connected to each other by weights. And the value of a neuron at each layer is computed using the inputs um, from the previous layer and an activation function. And so an example activation function is something called a rectified linear unit which is just the max of zero and X, where X in this case is the weighted sum of the inputs to a neuron plus a bias term, where both the weights and the biases are what you are learning when you optimize this network. So in short, if you go back to this example, this is what's called a fully connected network. All the neurons in one layer are connected to the, all the neurons in the next. And to compute kind of a given neuron in that second layer, you're taking a weighted sum of all the neurons in the first layer where those weights are learned. Now I should say you would never use this type of fully connected network in practice. There are other architectures that are much more effective at learning, but if you understand uh, this example of what this, you know, what we would call a vanilla fully connected network is doing, um, you can kind of understand what any neural network it's doing. So essentially it's taking, it's weighting together the neurons in the previous layer to compute the neurons in the next layer. Typically in practice, a network is not going to be fully connected because your number of parameters will blow up really quickly, but this gives you an intuition for what it's doing. Um, and we're putting these together with this ReLU function, having these nonlinearities is important. Um, and so the activation then becomes the input to the next layer of the neural network. Or if it's the final layer, it's the output of the network. And the deep and deep learning comes from these many layers of transformation. So this toy example, this is not a deep network. Okay, this only has uh, a few layers, but um, deep learning, comes from being able to put many, many of these layers together. Okay. And let's see. All right. Um, so model, the model parameters, the weights that you're using to compute the neurons in the next layer, typically number in the millions to billions, and they are estimated by minimizing a cost function that compares model predictions to the ground truth. Um, and the widespread applicability of deep learning has been driven by the fact that the resulting data representations can be turned 
uh, can be tuned um, to a wide variety of downstream tasks by exposing the model to relevant empirical examples. Okay, so I'm going to give you a little bit of an intuition for how you optimize a neural network. Please stick with me, we will get to applications, um, but this is, this is kind of a very surface level um, introduction to like how, how would you actually optimize this thing? Um, and so we minimize the loss function uh, through something called back propagation, uh, which is based on the chain rule. So as with any minimization problem, we need to know the gradient of the loss function. Um, you know, so the loss is typically going to be some function that compares how similar your output is to the ground truth. You need to take the gradient of that loss with respect to each weight in the network in order to minimize the function. And to compute this, first input data are fed into the neural network, producing an output. Um, and that output is compared to the ground truth data to compute the loss. So this is known as the forward pass because you're taking your input data and passing it forward through the neural network in order to compute your loss function. Um, and then next, we compute the gradient of the loss with respect to the output. And for each layer, starting from the output layer and moving backwards, um, all the way through the network to the input layer, we compute the gradient of the loss with respect to the weights in that layer. And this requires using the chain rule. The chain rule allows us to compute the derivative of the loss with respect to any weight in the network by multiplying together the derivatives computed layer by layer. Um, and we will adjust the weights uh, using a gradient descent algorithm. And so the most important thing to note about this, you know, from this is that, and, you know, if you think about a network like the one I just showed you, um, th this is going to have a problem um, if, if we're trying to optimize a deep network. Um, and that problem is that um, the gradients will tend to disappear if you have many layers in the network. And so as we back propagate, uh, we're continuously multiplying gradients um, from, the, um, from the forward layers in the network together. And these gradients can be small and they can become exponentially smaller as you have more and more layers of the network. And therefore you have to chain together um, uh, more and more gradient, more, more and more small numbers, more and more gradients with the chain rule to compute the gradient with respect to the early layers in the network. And so if the gradient becomes extremely small for the initial layers, because you're chaining together all these small numbers as you back propagate through the network, learning will be very slow or it may stop altogether and that will prevent the minimization of the cost function. Um, and so again, in those videos by three blue, one brown on YouTube, it gives a great graphical introduction uh, to gradient descent um, and um, to uh, back propagation. Um, you know, there's other resources on my website for those of you who are familiar with it, like Andre Karpathy, who's this sort of, he's, um, anyways, he, he was the chief AI, AI scientist at Tesla, but he's also great in terms of like education for deep learning. He has an amazing back prop tutorial. So there's lots of resources out there. Um, but the key thing that I wanna say now is that many major advances in deep learning are essentially about solving this problem by uh, ensuring that the gradient is able to flow through the network. And the reason that we have deep learning is that people figured out how to get around this problem. We won't go into how they did that today, but um, for example, if you check out the convolutional neural network slides and lecture on my website, uh, you can learn more about that. Okay, you can see that here. Um, and so, the field of deep learning is largely organized around benchmark data sets, which means there's some task um, and people are competing to see whose model can do the best on that task. Um, this is about a task called uh, ImageNet, which is the main task in computer vision. It's a data set that has a massive number of natural images, like pictures of dogs, cats, et cetera. Um, and the goal is to train a neural network that can classify, you know, is this a dog? Is this a cat? Is it a car, truck, et cetera? Um, and so you can see here on the right side of the graph, 
Uh, these are the competitions in uh, 2010 and 2011. This is before the era of deep learning. Um, and they're, they're doing pretty horrible. They're getting like 28, 25% of stuff wrong. In 2012, we have a model called AlexNet with the advent of deep learning. It's still very shallow by modern standards, but they're already doing much better. And then things really take off. Um, and you see uh, by 2015, we have a model that's 152 layers deep. This is a model called ResNet. Again, if you want to really understand neural networks and advances in them, it's an important one to understand these models. I don't talk about what they're doing in 2010, 2011. I have no idea. It's not deep learning. Um, but you can go to the convolutional neural network uh, lecture on my website and learn about kind of these advances. And they really kind of illustrate how progress in deep learning was made because this 2012 paper is, is really important to the start of the deep learning revolution. But the key thing to take away is deep neural networks, more accurate predictions, um, but there were challenges to getting there. Okay, but you might say, okay, well, why? Why do neural networks need to be so large? Okay, and I wanna give a little bit of an intuition for this by showing you an example. Um, and so suppose um, that we want to learn a classifier. So a classifier is a function that combines the inputs with weights uh, to produce a vector with the class probabilities. Um, and suppose that we are, um, that we're going to estimate a linear classifier. And to do that, a linear classifier, you're just gonna multiply the learned weights uh, times the inputs. So suppose we have 32 by 32 images. So these are pretty coarse images. Um, the three is the RGB color channel. And we want to classify which of 10 classes each of the image belongs to. Is it a car, a horse, et cetera? So this is a very um, basic problem by deep learning standards, but let's see how far we can get with a linear classifier. Uh, so our class probabilities are 10 by one. We have a probability for each class. And if we take our 32 by 32 by three input image and restack it into a column vector, that's gonna have a dimensionality of 3072 by one. So hence our weight matrix must be 10 by 3072. That already kind of probably sounds like a lot of parameters to you um, if you're an economist, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll see how far that we can get with that. So, um, and so what this implies is that we can think of that weight matrix as consisting of a single 32 by 32 by three template for each of the 10 classes. And each image will be compared pixel by pixel to each of the template filters to assess the class probabilities. Um, so let me show you some pictures so this can make more sense. Here we've simplified this. We just have a two by two um, image. And so we restack that into a four by one vector and we have three class probabilities. Um, so we're going to need to learn uh, a four by three uh, matrix. Um, and in this picture, what I'm showing you is what happens um, if you train a linear classifier on a data set called CIFAR 10. Um, so this is another image classification data set. Uh, there's uh, images in this data set that belong to 10 different classes, a car, uh, a horse, a dog, et cetera. And your goal is to be able to classify um, what class they belong to. So if you were to estimate a linear classifier and to plot the weights, um, this is what you get. Um, and so you can see, for example, there on the right, you see like a two-headed horse. Um, and you know, you're gonna compare each of the input images to these templates. That's what the model is gonna do to try to figure out which one it is. Which of these images does the input image look the most like? And you can see, but you only get one of them for each class. And so with the horse, it's trying there to capture with that learned two-headed horse that the horse can be facing in another direction. But think about all the images of, of say, of cars or dogs or horses that you could feed into this. The horse can be facing left or right. It can be tiny, it can be big, it can be posed differently. It can be in different parts of the image. Somebody could be riding it, it could be pulling something like, there's just a huge diversity in ways that you can portray a horse. And your goal with the image classifier is no matter kind of what, you know, how it's positioned in the image, no matter what color it is, et cetera, like that the classifier will be able to recognize that it's a horse. And you can see just, if we just had this linear classifier, um, 10 times 3,072 parameters, so 30,000 parameters around, like this is what you get. And this is just incredibly crude. You know, it requires millions of parameters. 
um, to be able to capture the complexity um, inherent in depicting a horse or other objects. Okay, so what neural network do we use anyways? Um, so this is a slide uh, showing what deep learning would have looked like historically. So I'm like, by historically, I mean like 2016. If you're in deep learning, this is like the dark, dark ages, okay? Um, and so in, in vision, you have convolutional neural networks, which I talked about very briefly. In natural language processing, you have something called an LSTM. These other areas, reinforcement learning, translation, speech, they all have their own models. Um, and generally, like people who worked in NLP probably are not doing so much work in computer vision. Um, well, if you come forward to the day, CNNs are still very useful <laughs> and like we use them a lot. You should know what they are, but these other architectures, you know, like um, LSTM is pretty much dead. Um, and this is deep learning today. Um, and so you see across different applications, what am I depicting here? Well, this is the architecture of the transformer, um, which I am not going to have time today. I would never get to applications if I did um, to explain to you um, what uh, the transformer is, but it's a neural network architecture. It's used in natural language processing. Um, so GPT is using a transformer. BERT is using a transformer. It's used in computer vision. It's used in reinforcement learning. It's used in translation. It's used in um, audio. It's used in graph neural networks a little bit. Um, and so essentially like this architecture has really taken over deep learning. Um, and of course, um, on my website and my knowledge base in the AEA continuing education lectures, you can see me talk about this architecture in more detail. Um, so by the way, this includes transformer large language models. I have here a figure that Abhishek, who's sitting there in the front row, um, adopted from the original BERT paper that kind of gives an intuition that I want you to have in your heads um, for how a transformer large language model would work. So we have um, a sequence of text that we would like to pass in. And so we start by taking each word, or it could be a subword, and we look it up in a, in a tokenizer. And that's going to tell us a vector representation for each of these texts. And so every word in our sentence is going to have a vector associated with it. Then we're going to pass it through this thing called the transformer. It's a neural network. It's a black box for right now. But if you want to, there's a lot of great resources to learn about it. But anyways, we pass it through the transformer. And then in the last layer, we get a vector representation, a dense vector representation for each word in our input sequence. So for each word, we get out a 768 dimensional dense vector. Whereas think about when you're putting in like the English language is sparse. You know, if you want to encode what I'm saying, you could take a vector whose dimensionality is the size of the English vocabulary and each word has a one or a zero. What you're getting out of here is representations of that text in a continuous vector space. Um, and each word has a representation, and that representation is going to depend on the context in which it's used. And so if you're talking about a riverbank, that's going to be a very different representation than, you know, I, I took my money to Citizens Bank. Depending on the context, the representation of that word will change. You also have something here at the beginning called the class token, which is like a representation for the entire text sequence that you pass the model. Um, and so suppose you want to do document classification. Uh, I want to know if this document is about sports, is about movies, etc. cetera. Um, I just put a classifier head um, on top of the, the, um, the class token at the beginning, which is a representation for the document. Uh, suppose I want to classify relationships between texts. I want to say, are these two texts the same or different? Well, I can feed them both into the transformer. Um, and then I am going to just, again, put a classifier head on top of the class token. Now, suppose I want to recognize named entities in the text. So I want to recognize, is this text a person, a location, an organization? They can be whatever class you want. Okay, but person, location, organization would be common. Uh, types of entities that you'd like to recognize, or is it some other text? Well, now we're in the world of a token classification text. We want to classify every word of text, but we do that kind of using the exact same transformer model. Now we just put a classifier onto each of those tokens. Uh, same thing, if we ask a question and we want to know where the answer is to it, we just predict the span of text, you know, on top of those tokens that, that contain an answer. And so basically, like if you were in the pre-BERT kind of pre-transformer era, um, 
you know, you would have different specialized architectures for each of these tasks. Now with transformer large language models, everything's a transformer. Um, another thing that we'll see commonly in the applications I'm gonna show you is not using exactly this model, but using a related model, forget the SEP token and just take the average of all the tokens in your text and work with that directly in vector space. That's gonna be a very common way that we use large language models. Now, um, you might say, well, what about, how does, how does chat GPT work? I'm kind of the same thing. It's a transformer. It's trained in a different way than BERT that we're not gonna get into, but it's a transformer. And at each step, so at each step in the sequence, it is predicting what word comes next. And so you just have you know, a classifier over the vocabulary and you're predicting which word is most likely to come next. And so basically like GPT works in a very similar way too. If you understand the transformer, you have gone a long ways to understanding deep learning. All right, and so that's it for my um, brief introduction. Um, and so now I'm going to get into the uh, applications. Um, but I guess before I launch into applications, I know people may have a lot of questions in their mind, um, but um, uh, are there any questions about kind of the basics of neural networks? All right, like I said, I know I went through a lot of information, but there are a lot of resources out there um, for those of you who are interested in learning more. All right, um, so now I'm going to talk about processing traditional data sources at scale. All right, and so the application that I'm going to give is using disaggregated data to understand long run development. So many central questions in economics, things like misallocation, inequality, social mobility, require disaggregated data. You're going to have a hard time studying these topics with aggregated data. Um, yet it's rare to have digital disaggregated data over long periods. And the data that do exist tend to be overwhelmingly from high resource contexts like the historical United States or Europe. Um, and so for example, I have a longstanding interest in East Asia's spectacular growth performance in the 20th century. You have a region that starts out very poor and is incredibly successful economically and converges with the global frontier. But we don't really understand much at all about that habit, how that happened. Most of what we have is pretty highly aggregated and there's, you know, it's informative, but there's only so much you can do with highly aggregated data. Um, you know, when I first became interested in this, you know, and tried to work on it as a grad student, I thought maybe the data didn't exist. It turns out massive amounts of data do exist, but they've just never been processed at scale. Um, and so, Data are particularly rich in the case of Japan. They stretch back to the early 20th century. There's amazing firm and individual level records. Why haven't people worked with these more? Um, well, they can use over 13,000 different kanji characters. Um, and you will not find a modern Japanese speaker who will accurately digitize these. Like I will just tell you, like getting ground truth data for these was a lot of work because so many of these characters are so similar. They're not used in modern Japanese. Um, so there's just no way on earth you're going to manually digitize these. Even if you could, it's way too expensive. There's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pages, millions of pages of records, you know, that we would like to digitize. It would be completely impossible to do by hand. Um, you could say, well, why don't you just take a sample? Uh, but for a lot of the questions we're interested in, they're thing about things like networks where sampling might lead to biases. This is an example document that we'd like to process. This is firm level record uh, from historical Japan that contains rich information about who are a firm's managers, who are their shareholders, um, you know, their balance sheet information, what products they produce, what's their company history, where are they located, what facilities do they have, et cetera. Um, so we would like to take this and we want to turn it into something like this, essentially turn it into a knowledge graph. Um, and so this is one component of the knowledge graph that we extracted from this publication. And so this is showing supply chains. And so for each firm, we have lists of who are their customers and suppliers. Of course, there's no unique identifiers in this time, just lists of firms. And if we're able to digitize these and link everything together, um, we can, can create these supply chain networks. And so what you're looking at here is the size of the dot is proportional 
to the uh, degree centrality of that firm in the supply chain network. And uh, this was data from the 1950s. And the shaded dots are firms that the US tried to break up in Japan after World War II. And you can see that they basically you know, survived just fine. And this has been a question of historical debate. What was the success of efforts to break up these large conglomerates in post-war Japan? Um, and essentially what you see in this graph is the most central forms in the supply chain network in the late 1950s um, tend to be kind of the same ones that were targeted by the US to, to break up. This is just one example of many types of information that you could extract from these data um, if you had a way to process them at scale. And so I wanna talk about what processing them at scale takes. So we have a bunch of different documents. We're gonna have some pipeline. We like to get structured output. It could be you know, a JSON or a CSV file. It could be a graph like this. Um, and we quickly found that designing these pipelines was very challenging. Um, and so when I started working on this, uh, there was no full-fledged infrastructure for curating document, document image data sets and fine-tuning uh, layout analysis models to recognize the layouts of those documents. Uh, the relevant resources that did exist were in different repositories and they used inconsistent backends and APIs. Um, and so let me just uh, give you an example. Um, and so maybe I, first of all, I need to pre-process the data set. And to do that, maybe I find something that's kind of useful. It's written in Java. Um, and then I need to detect layouts to do that. That's deep learning, I need PyTorch. Um, and then recognizing characters, well, maybe I need to write that with C++. And then I need to do some post-processing. Maybe I go, you know, there's some repository that's kind of helpful for, for that, but that's in MATLAB. And finally, I need a way to store all this data and so again, I find something that's kind of useful, but I have to use C++ again. Um, so obviously this is not very reproducible. It's not very transparent uh, to anybody who doesn't have a lot of background um, and isn't able to spend a lot of time on it. And this can lead research teams to invest significant resources, essentially in reinventing the document image analysis wheel. And it makes document image analysis inaccessible for those with less well-developed technical backgrounds. And so I worked um, with a couple of my pre-docs, Zhejiang Shen um, and Jake Carlson, as well as open source collaborators to integrate the models and tools we developed into an open source package called Layout Parser. Uh, the aim of Layout Parser is to streamline the use of deep learning and document image analysis pipelines. Layout Parser provides uh, simple and intuitive interfaces for applying and customizing deep learning models for layout detection and other document processing tasks. And so it consists of several components. We have an off-the-shelf toolkit for applying deep learning models for layout detection, character recognition, and other document image analysis tasks. Uh, this is supported by a repository of pre-trained neural network models that underlie off-the-shelf usage. And so essentially what this means is that if you want to process documents that look very similar to documents uh, that these models were trained on, you can just use these models off the shelf. Of course, there's an incredible diversity of documents and documents tend to be a space, you know, so all these models, they were pre-trained on ImageNet. That's the, Im that's the image data set of like dogs and cats and cars and buses and stuff. They didn't see documents in pre-training. Um, so what these models have seen in terms of documents is just what we or other people like tune them on. Um, and so because of that, they tend to be kind of like brittle. Um, to moving you know, away um, from what the documents they were trained on looked like. So there's many scenarios where your documents just don't look like documents already in the uh, model zoo. And so you may need to train your own model. Um, and we provide tools to make that straightforward um, and also have a model hub and community platform. And the library is implemented with simple Python APIs. And so it's straightforward to install. Um, I've had people become enraged at me <laughs> for this slide um, because they were trying to install it on Windows. Um, I don't recommend ever doing deep learning on Windows. It can be done, but you probably just don't want to go there. Um, there's something called Google Colab. Uh, there's a free plan, which is like, okay, or you can pay $9.99 a month um, for Colab Pro. Um, and Colab is designed to like make it easy for students to use GPUs, essentially. 
and every, you know, it's already resolved all the dependencies. So any kind of deep learning library, it's going to have a lot of dependencies. And if you install it on your own machine, you're going to have to resolve all those dependencies. It takes particular versions of many different types of software. Um, if you use a collab, that's already largely been done for you. So it just make your life easier. And it's like 999. You can't do everything on there. If you have a really big project, you're probably gonna, you know, you're trying to train something really in depth. You probably need your own GPU. But for many people, Colab works well. Um, it sometimes it will rate limit you. If you really like need Colab hardcore, there's also like a super pro plan, I think for like $40 or something a month. So I'm not trying to sell Google Colab. I just see it make all my students' lives so much easier and they're not pulling their hair out trying to install things on windows that were never intended to be installed on windows all right um so this is an example of layout detection this is actually a page uh, from our paper um on layout parser and you can see that we're able to detect the layouts that are plotted here uh, with just those lines of code so it's really minimal coding um so i want to take a little bit of a deeper look at what it looks like um, to use layout parser uh, off the shelf, um, so with the pre-trained models. Um, so you see here, we need to specify uh, the model configuration, which consists of the training data set. So what was this model trained on? In this case, it's PubLineNet. That's a data set of PDFs. Um, and what neural network do we use? In this case, it's a neural network called MaskRCNN of depth 50 with the feature pyramid work, okay? Um, some data sets we have trained on multiple models. You can understand what those models are in my deep learning lectures, so you can just experiment and see what works for you. Then we need to say what our backend is. In this case, it's Detectron 2. There's different kind of backends that you can use for layout detection. You know, again, I, I talk about this more in my uh, lecture notes. Um, and then we need to call the standardized model detection API. So suppose we wanted to change something. Um, now I've changed the neural network that was trained on from something called mask RNN to something called faster RCNN. Um, I want to switch the model to something trained on a different data set because um, my documents don't look like the data set I showed you previously. Well, then you just change it in this part um, to, to a data set called Primo Layout. I want to change my backend. Well, now I changed it to Paddle Detect, which is another backend. So we try to make it really intuitive um, to call the models that you want to call. Um, and determining how or if layout parser can meet your needs, I think it's important to ask three questions. How different is my target data, the data I want to process from the predefined models, the pre-trained models in the model zoo? What are my accuracy efficiency requirements? And this is going to be very different, I think, if you're like a faculty member um, writing a paper that you want to publish in a journal versus if you're a student writing your final project. You know, students writing their final paper for a class have maybe less access to compute, but also lower um, accuracy requirements um, and how much training data are available to you. And so, for example, um, you know, let's say we're in the world where your, your, your target data are similar to a pre-trained model um, and you really want things to be efficient. Well, you can use one of our pre-trained models off the shelf with the efficient detection backend. Um, at the other extreme, which is maybe more typical of us as academic economists, your data are really different from anything that people have processed before, or at least that people have uploaded. Um, and uh, you really want things to be accurate, and um, you have some training data available. Well, then you're going to need to tune your own model. That's going to require creating some labels. Um, and again, I'm not going to really have time to go into this here, um, but we have a lot more guidance on this um, on my website. So you're going to need to create your own labels and you can use layout parser um, to tune your layout analysis model. I want to make one other note, um, just very briefly, you might say, how do I know what to label? Um, you could just draw content at random. So let's say that you want to like label these newspapers here, which is a task that we actually did. Um, you could just uh, draw thing, you know, pages to label at random. The problem with doing that is that we think with documents, the layout distribution uh, like is, is a, a long tail distribution. And so if you just draw randomly, you'll get tons of images from the belly of this distribution that all look similar and you'll have more labels than you need because the model's already seen examples of images like that. It doesn't need you to label more images, but if you just drop random, you'll get too many of those and you won't get enough from the tails. Um, and um, so with Zhejiang and other 
uh, collaborators, we also developed a perturbation algorithm that allows us to oversample objects where the model has low confidence um, and label those. Um, and we've done various experiments to show that this substantially decreases labeling costs and improves model performance. Okay, and this is an example of how we even kind of um, tuned our interface for labeling something called Label Studio um, to, to, to be useful for this. Um, uh, the other thing I want to say here is that like, you don't have to label everything from scratch. Let's say you have a model, it's working okay, but not working as good as you want. You can take the predictions, put them into Label Studio, which is the annotation software and correct them. And let's say it gets, you know, uh, 18 out of 20 things right on a page, you're only having to correct two things. That's a lot faster um, than labeling 20 things from scratch. All right, so this is what it looks like for the Japanese documents I showed you. Uh, we train a model using layout parser to recognize the document layout. So we see we recognize here columns and segments, like what's the title, what's an address, what's a variable name, what's a variable value, what's a number, et cetera. All right, okay, so now we have the document layouts and we need these because otherwise we have no idea how to put stuff in the document together. And we also have no idea what even needs to be digitized. Okay, so now we have the layouts. Step number two, OCR. Um, this was a major challenge. The Japanese documents use over 13,000 characters, most no longer in use. We tried every possible existing OCR solution. If it was open source, we tuned it. Um, you know, but there, there wasn't much open source that would handle these documents. We tried uh, everything out there. The best thing we found was Baidu OCR, which is supposed to be great for Asian languages. Um, Baidu is a leading Chinese company, um, but it got over half a character's wrong. Okay, and I want to use these data. I want to use the numbers to run a, run a regression. I want to match people like across data sets. And Japanese name maybe has like four characters. If I get one of them wrong, like there's no way I'm matching that person, right? So this is just horrible totally unusable. And this was the best thing that there was. Okay. So like, um, at that point you say, well, like we need, maybe we need to just tune our own thing. But what we discovered is that that doesn't oftentimes work so well because the predominant, um, OCR architecture is something called sequence to sequence, um, where we take learned vision embeddings, um, as inputs to a jointly learned language model. And it takes a massive amount of data to jointly learn a language and vision model um, because you're not just like already taking learning a language model requires a lot uh, but it's not like you're learning a language model to process text your inputs to your language model are like patches um, patch embeddings from the vision model um, and so for example uh, in a state-of-the-art transformer sequence to sequence OCR by Microsoft was trained using 684 million English uh, text lines and 32, 32 gigabyte V100 GP. So just to translate that, this is not compute that anybody at this university can afford. This is like Microsoft compute, like not academic compute. You can't do that. You cannot train a sequence to sequence model on 684 million text lines as an academic. You can't. Like only Microsoft in places like that can do that. Um, and um, the problem is like, I, I want to train something for Japanese and actually it's not just Japanese. There's a lot of other, you know, I'm a development economist. I study economic history and development economics. I would like to digitize data for lots of contexts where existing OCR fails because there is no commercial market and tuning an open source seek to seek has its limitations because seek to seek, it's not very sample efficient. That means this architecture, it takes a lot of examples to learn from. It's very data hungry. And I can't tell you how costly it is to like label for OCR. Like you want your RA to quit, <laughs> like ask them to label something for OCR, right? People do not want to do this. I do not want to do this. I really need to minimize labeling requirements. Um, and so I worked with um, uh, Jake Carlson, who's a PhD student here, Tom Bryan, and we developed a novel character-based OCR that aims to come full circle with early conceptions of OCR from the 1920s, focusing on the optical recognition of individual characters. Um, and beyond developing this architecture, we worked also with Abhishek, who's here, you can tell him thank you afterwards to make an open source package uh, that makes it straightforward to tune uh, your own uh, OCR model. So let me say a word more about this. And so this is our architecture. This figure kind of illustrates uh, what's very different about our approach. So in the bottom, you have the standard sequence to sequence approach. 
you don't detect individual characters. It just kind of divides those line level inputs. And with OCR, it's always line level inputs. It divides those into kind of arbitrary patches. And you have a neural network that encodes those into vector representations. And then you have a language model that takes those encodings of the image patches as inputs and predicts which characters they are. Um, and again, this is very data intensive because you're jointly learning that vision model and that language model, and those both have hundreds of millions of parameters. Okay, what we do instead is, first of all, we use um, document layout analysis as an object detection to recognize the characters, individual characters. So first of all, we localize where those characters are. And so now our input is characters, and then we trained a model, mostly on digital fonts, um, that will take characters that are the same character, but they look different. They use a different font. There's noise, you know, they have a different background and map them to similar vector representations and take characters that look very similar, but they're different characters and match them uh, and, and map them to different parts of this vector space. And then to figure out which character it is, we just take a digital font. We pass it through the same model to encode it and we take the nearest neighbor like of so you have a and you pass the character a into this model it gives you a vector representation of it and we say what's the nearest neighbor in terms of the vector representation of a digital font if that's a we call that character a so that takes no learn parameters right so we're just learning the parameters in this vision model and it turns out that really small by deep learning standards, so like 10 million parameter vision models designed for mobile phones actually do a really good job of this problem because it's very parsimonious. I'm not having all sorts of arbitrary patches of characters come out that have to be decoded. Like it's just, we've already recognized the characters and we're feeding that meaningful unit um, and, um, and then just identifying what that is. And so, you know, honestly, in my mind, this is like kind of how I thought OCR worked before I delved into it. I assumed it recognized characters at some point along the way and said what well, characters are similar. This is kind of how OCR was conceptualized in the early 20th century. Uh, we moved away from it because it wasn't very good. And having the context is gonna be really useful, like if your model's not very good. And so my model's not very good at telling about whether this is an A or not, but if I see its context, I can, you know, it can be better. But now like our vision encoders are just really, really good. And so unless the document is outright like illegible, like you don't really need the context, it does actually does, you know, better than these seek to seek models by and large. Um, and so this is just a graph showing sample efficiency. So we tried tuning different architectures from scratch on a couple of different data sets, an English one and Japanese one. The orange line is our model. Uh, that pink and green lines are the giant, um, you know, the giant uh, Microsoft seek to seek transformer model. And the uh, like purple and dark green lines are other open source models that are smaller, um, but still learn. And, and what you can see here is like on the X axis, that's how much data you've exposed to, how many characters you've shown the model in training. And on the Y axis is the error rate, how much it's getting wrong. And you can see like our architecture, it just drops to a very low error rate very quickly. And that's called sample efficiency. It's, it doesn't take a lot of exposure um, for it to learn. Um, whereas these kind of more data hungry architectures, they take a lot more data. And now that might be good. Like, you know, if you're Amazon, maybe you want a field to be dominated by a super data hungry architecture because it's good for keeping competition out. Like I cannot train like a sequence to sequence transformer model because look at those pink and green lines with all the compute I can reasonably muster. Look at this, it's like learning incredibly slowly. It's gonna take forever for that to get down where the orange line is like on my compute, maybe on Microsoft's compute, it can be reasonable, but, um, and so, um, as I mentioned, um, Tom and Jake and Abhishek like put a ton of work into taking this architecture and um, turning it into a package that makes it straightforward to tune your own custom efficient OCR model, including for very low resource settings. And this was, you know, important to us. Historians spend a lot of time thinking about how documentary history is skewed towards those who left behind documents. Like that's what a lot of history is about, and that's true. 
Uh, but when you look at digital documentary history, the skew is much, much worse uh, because essentially, at, you know, economic historians, people working with digital history, we are like have largely relied on tools made by commercial entities to try to digitize our documents. Um, some people have made efforts otherwise, but like there's a lot of reliance on uh, existing commercial tools. And that means the data sets that we can digitize accurately are gonna kind of look like commercial applications, which is like receipts in English. Like that is Amazon's number one OCR application, right? That's not our interest as development economists by and large. Um, and, um, and so we aim to make it easy for people to tune their own OCR model. And you might still be telling me like, Melissa, I just like, I just don't believe this is gonna be straightforward for me. Well, we have a demo notebook that you can use to train your own OCR model to recognize uh, polytonic or ancient Greek. And we showed that if you kind of follow our notebook and uh, train your own model for ancient Greek, um, we, we show that this customized model, which can be trained with free student compute credits in the cloud, beats Google Cloud Vision, which is state of the art for ancient Greek. Of course, it's been tuned to a particular set of Greek documents. I'm not saying that it beats Google Cloud Vision for any kind of ancient Greek documents that you could throw at it. But if you're a researcher and you say, my interest is in this collection of ancient Greek documents, this collection of documents in a particular African language, an endangered language, et cetera, like you can tune stuff for that collection and probably be beating the state of the art. Um, but you might still be saying, well, I don't know. What I care about is can I use this thing off the shelf? Is this useful for me off the shelf? Um, I don't want to tune anything. I don't, I just want to type in a line of code and get my OCR out. Um, you know, well, we looked at that. Um, we randomly sampled documents from the US National Archives. So you can see examples here. There's a lot of heterogeneity. And we showed that our model trained on English newspapers, so not on archival documents on newspapers, was pretty comparable to other open source solutions. So it was comparable to Easy OCR, to Paddle OCR, um, other open source solutions. Um, on English, Google Cloud Vision is going to tend to beat everything else. When you move beyond English, that's going to be less true. So yes, you can use this off the shelf, and it will probably be comparable to Tesseract, Easy OCR, Paddle OCR, et cetera. At least it was on this set of randomly selected documents from the National Archives. Um, but you know, it doesn't really aim to be an off the shelf shelf solution at this point. We aim to give you kind of something that you can use and you can tune it to your own context. And I think, you know, for us as development economists, we're disproportionately likely to be interested in low resource or endangered languages. And beyond the sample efficiency that I showed you, there's other things that are useful. So it can see characters and training with whatever distribution you want. And so like over 60% of endangered languages use the Latin script, just like English does. Uh, but if you were to train an OCR, like a multilingual language model, um, on Latin script documents for the hope that you could use that to OCR these documents. It's been shown that that creates a lot of problems because the distribution of Latin characters that we use in English is different than the distribution of Latin characters that an endangered language would use. Uh, but with this model, if you tune your own model, you can choose easily whatever distribution of characters you want. And so if there's lots and lots of X's, you can choose lots of lots of X's in training. Um, you can also mix and match scripts. Uh, which is common in endangered languages. And to our knowledge, there's not other OCR engines that allow you to mix and match scripts. Um, and you can add new characters at inference time. And so this is actually like, you know, so if you do sequence to sequence, the model has to see that character during training to recognize it. That's not true um, with our approach. You can add new characters to inference time. And this is very useful. Obviously, it would be useful if you were like an archaeologist and discovering new characters. But even in the stuff we digitize, like we trained a model for Japanese. Um, we wanted to digitize another publication. It had this weird telephone symbol on it, okay, that we did not know about, would not have thought to include in our training. We didn't need to retrain the model. We can just encode that telephone symbol with our existing neural network, and it recognized it pretty well, and it stopped misrecognizing it as other things that were screwing us up. And I'd say that this is probably pretty common with historical documents. So all these features are useful. Okay, so I've shown you document layout analysis. I've shown you OCR. Are we done processing those Japanese data? Unfortunately not, um, which probably you guys will appreciate too if you work with these sorts of uh, data sources. Um, so we now we have an accurate digitization of them, but we want to link them across different sources. So across different firms in the same book, across different publications, across different years. Um, 
And this is just very common, like record linkage is at the core of a lot of economic research, you know, unless you, you know, you're working in very kind of specific settings, usually you don't have unique identifiers to do record linkage. Um, and so typically um, we would use string similarity measures uh, such as edit distance. So how many edits does it take to turn one string into another? or n-gram overlap. So how many substrings do these two strings have in common um, in order to do record linkage? Um, and this can cause problems. Like if you have ABC CEO and ABC Corporation, those aren't very, they, they don't have a high string similarity, but obviously they're the same thing. Um, and um, so again, Thank you, Abhishek. Again, like you all should really, um, uh, really thank him after this talk. He's really uh, put so much, um, so much into this work. Um, so with Abhishek, uh, we bring large language models to standard data frame manipulation tasks like um, merges uh, for record linkage, deduplication, and clustering. Um, we have a website that you can check out. Um, and uh, so Link Transformer lets you use Transformer large language models to do record linkage and other tasks. Um, uh, the API is designed to be familiar to people who are used to using R and Stata. And so you have to do deep learning in Python. You just, you just kind of do, um, unless you're doing something really niche that's even kind of, you know, um, uh, sort of more involved. Basically, you cannot, you cannot do deep learning in R. Please do not try to do deep learning in R. You have to do it in Python. Uh, but we try to make it as familiar as possible in the way that you use this API to people who are used to using R and Stata because like we know it's just like people are busy. It's a huge cost to learn something new. So we want to make it straightforward. Um, Link Transformer supports all language models on the Hugging Face Hub. And it also supports open AI models. And so if you want to use um, open AI embeddings um, uh, from GPT um, to do record linkage, you can do that easily too. You know, you will have to have your key and pay for those embeddings, um, but this package makes it very easy. We've also trained our own collection of over 20 open source language models uh, for six different languages and for different tasks. Um, all right. And so um, I want to give some examples here. Um, and so the basic functionality would be doing something like, um, you know, merging, um, merging two data sets together. And you see the code that you would use uh, to do that here. It's very straightforward. You can directly merge the two data sets together, uh, but there's different things you can do. So essentially, like I won't get in under the hood about the way this works, um, but for each potential merge, you get a score. Like that score is the proximity of the dense vector representations of those texts. Um, and uh, you can use that score to say, what's the nearest neighbor? That would be like one match, but you can also have a cutoff. You say, I wanna know um, all matches that are under this threshold. Uh, you could say, um, you know, I wanna match uh, one to N, et cetera. Basically any way you would use edit distance, you can use the score from deep learning. Um, in this presentation, I've made it a philosophy not to bore you guys with lots of tables, but in our paper on this, we, we pursue a bunch of different record linkage tasks including real world tasks, linking Mexican tariff schedules from the 1940s and Japanese firm level data from the 1950s. And we show that on average using deep learning just far outperforms um, using um, using traditional matching methods, it's able to understand the semantic similarity between things in a way that's uh, that's very useful. So you can use it to do merging. You kind of use it just like you would use at a distance, but now you're using a large language model like OpenAI embeddings or one of our pre-trained models or any language model on Hugging Face that you want. And we do have tutorials where we give you a, uh, some guidance on how to choose which model you would want to use. Okay, really cool feature. You can use a multilingual language model to do multilingual merging without having to translate. So normally, like uh, let's say that you have data sets across different contexts, you wanna make a consistent industry classification and one of them's in French and one of them's in German. You have to translate first and then try to merge. Um, with a multilingual language model, you don't have to do that. And it's actually, it's just, again, this simple line of code. You can merge data sets that are in multiple languages. And we show in the paper that it does a very accurate job of that. Whereas um, trying to use translation and then use an at a distance space metric is basically like a disaster. Um, and so I think this, you know, I've had a long standing interest in like 
comparative development across different contexts. And like one of the things that made me abandon a project was needing to uh, merge classifications across different languages where the like translate and then just use edit distance was like a disaster. And this really makes that sort of project where you're working with multiple languages, um, I, it makes it a lot easier. So hopefully this facilitates like comparative development work. You can deduplicate. You can aggregate. So say you have like products and you want to aggregate them into industries. We have pre-trained models for that and uh, it supports that. Model training is straightforward. Um, and model sharing is important. It's very straightforward to upload your model to Hugging Face, which is the main hub for deep learning. Um, you use this command, it will automatically create a model card uh, that populates uh, information about what you're doing. And I would like to, again, I would like to really encourage everybody to do this. I mean, I've done a lot of work and published a fair bit in computer science and the contrast between that and economics has been kind of illuminating. So I think like oftentimes, like um, in the deep learning literature and computer science, people wanna get their stuff up on GitHub as fast as possible. That's how I mark that I did this, is to put my code and my data up as quickly as I can. Um, I think in economics, it's much more, let me drag my feet into the last possible minute when the journal makes me share this. Um, you know, to, and I think it like, we just, we have really difficult problems to solve. And I think the fact that deep learning is not perfect, sometimes people's code is horrible. Um, but I think the fact that it has this culture, you know, whenever possible, um, helps the field to advance more quickly. And we wanna encourage this kind of culture in economics where people share their stuff and maybe there's even a professional reward for sharing your stuff. You know, you can put on your CV, you know, this is my page on Hugging Face and this is how many stars I have and how many forks from GitHub. Like right now, economists would not care one lick about that. But I think, you know, hopefully in the future, this is seen as a, a form of professional service, just like other things. Um, and so we very, make it very easy to share your models. Okay, I just wanna say like one more thing. Um, and so again, I think like this is particularly useful um, for development economics, because let's say you do work on US censuses, um, all the way back to 1920, there's something called SoundX, which recognizes that certain string substitutions are more likely than others. Um, there's something kind of similar called Masala merge recently for Hindi. Uh, there's something a little bit similar when merging Chinese, but when you move out of these high resource settings, like you lose that. And so you really don't have any alternative when doing string matching, but to treat kind of all substitutions as equally likely, kind of even though they're not. Um, and you know, you being able to use deep learning um, can, can, can help to account for that. Um, I also, you know, so this leads me into my next topic, which is, um, this is what I just showed you was uh, record linkage with language models. Um, you, you might think, well, it's not just language that is useful, like vision is useful. Um, OCR tends to make errors that are what we call homoglyphic. They confuse characters with a similar visual appearance. Um, and this can be uh, utilized to improve record linkage on noisily OCR text. Um, and together with uh, Shimei Yang and Xiaoyu Zhang and also Abhishek, you can see Abhishek is a theme in this lecture. <laughs> like, <laughs> really much of this work wouldn't have been possible without all the tremendous amount of work that he's put into it. Um, we leverage vision transformers. Uh, so this is like the transformer, but it's for vision, not for language, to measure the visual similarity across characters. And we use this to improve record linkage. We do this specifically for CJK, but we show you can extend it to other scripts. And again, we have a Python package and we try to make the syntax reminiscent of merging and stata in R. Okay, so approximate string matching methods count the number of edits, so insertions, deletions, substitutions to transform one string into another or compute ingram similarity, as I said on the previous slide. Uh, in practice, not all string substitutions are equally probable. Um, and we have things like I just mentioned, SoundX, Masala Merge, a fuzzy Chinese package. For certain high resource settings, people have hand engineered what kind of substitutions, string substitutions are most likely. Um, and they've used that um, to improve record linkage. Do you know these two strings are probably the same because the thing that's different about them is, is likely according to this list of predefined substitutions. But unfortunately, we just don't have that. When you're a development economist and you're working in a low resource setting, you're not merging the US census. Um, you know, you're merging, um, uh, historical 
uh, census in, in Vietnam, and there's nothing like this in that context to make it like, easier. Um, and so these methods, they perform well, perhaps in the context that they're tailored to, but you move beyond that and you, you have nothing. And this, uh, again, skews research with linked data, which is necessary to examine many important economic questions towards a few higher resource settings that are not representative of the diversity of human societies. Um, and so the approach that we develop instead to compute these kind of substitution costs for string matching is fully self-supervised and it can be applied to any script. Um, and so we take, we look at character variation across fonts. And so you can see these are examples of the same character rendered in different fonts. And you can see there can be pretty um, significant character variation across fonts. And we train a neural network to take representations of the same character and map them to similar vector representations and take, rep take different characters and map them to different dissimilar vector representations. So we, and we do that all with digital fonts. So any language that has a digital font, you can do this with, and then we compute the similarity of different characters. And so uh, this figure is showing across different languages, um, a query character, and then we say, what is its five nearest neighbors in this vector space created by a neural network? And you can see it picks out characters that look very visually similar. So again, there was no labeled data that we had to create. This was done entirely with digital fonts. Um, uh, where we're mapping characters that are similar to the same representation, characters that are different to different representations. This was basically motivated by FOCR because that model is essentially the FOCR architecture, but you can see it works really well. It automatically uh, picks out characters that look very similar. And what we show in the paper is that you can use the similarity between these characters as the substitution cost in an edit distance uh, metric, and it significantly improves edit distance. Um, and this is very low cost, right? If you're working with OCR documents, it's like you, like our package is just a line of code. It's super low cost. You're not you're not training the model on your own. Um, it's just kind of accounting for the substitution costs, and we show that it can improve merging. So it really takes no technical background at all uh, to use this off the shelf. Uh, but you might say, well, you've, you've looked at Chinese, Japanese, Korean. Is this extensible um, to other settings? And so we look at a couple of other settings. So my favorite is we took ancient Chinese characters from 1300 BC. Um, and we used, again, uh, vision transformers to measure the character similarity between these characters from ancient China that were taken from these um, bone uh, script. Um, and what you, what's fascinating here is that this is just the visual similarity, but you see characters grouped together that archaeologists have argued have related abstract meaning. So writing, the way that these ancient peoples wrote writing is very similar to how they wrote law and how they wrote learning. It's also similar to mourning, which the character from mourning is recording the sun. And so you understand kind of why those are similar. And the second line, different types of government officials have visually similar characters. Um, and the third line you see like his, history, historian is very similar to the character for government because those two things were very interlinked, right? It's the government who wrote what history was. Um, you also see things like city center, which is a prisoner being executed because the state executed prisoners in the city center. And that's very similar to conquest or tying up. You see how these ancient societies related this abstract concept, but I'm not an archeologist. I don't know that, I don't know a darn thing about archeology. span Like I just trained a self-supervised vision transformer model and this popped out. And then a reading of the archeological literature tells us that the people have noted this before and it's what we would expect. Um, the other thing that we did is, um, you know, other, we, we look for similar characters across all of Unicode. And you can see in this example, it pulls out an Egyptian hieroglyph, a Latin uh, capital letter and uh, uh, symbols from two other languages that are, that are very similar. Right? So even across any script that you can sort of encode with Unicode, it's pulling out things that are similar. Uh, again, totally self-supervised. I don't, I don't have any idea about any of these languages. Like um, we just use the digital fonts 
Um, and it pulls out similar looking characters. The bottom line is that it can improve record linkage of OCR documents, but I also think there's something really cool here from a social science perspective about somehow how, how characters look, tell us something about how people think in societies that otherwise we don't have much of an understanding of. All right, one final thing I will say on record language is that you can combine image and text representations. I'd say that this is a little bit more involved, but it works really well. So we take both the OCR text and the crop of that text, and we combine it with what's called a multimodal model. Um, and so again, I'm not gonna have time to go into this in depth today, we think that the previous thing we showed you is useful because it's super easy to do. It takes kind of more technical capacity to train a multimodal model, but this is with the same set of authors um, and it works it, it, it works quite well. Um, and that's all I'll say, but yes, you can use both the image and the text with deep, uh, deep models, both a transformer, and that works better than using just one or just the other for record linkage. And so finally, we have everything that we needed to produce this graph. We needed to recognize layouts. We needed to do OCR with our own novel OCR architecture and then develop methods for record linkage because standard methods didn't work. And so this shows how you can take a traditional data source. It's kind of like the data sources that economists have processed. It, you could process by hand if it was really small, but it's not. Um, it makes it possible um, to, to understand economic phenomenon about Japan's economic uh, rapid economic growth uh, that were inaccessible to us previously. All right, in the final um, 18 minutes, well, part of the final 18 minutes, I wanna talk about creating novel types of data, and then I'll very briefly talk about the computational problems. Um, so you've seen using deep learning for tables, uh, we've also used deep learning to extract structured text data from over 50 million page scans of historical U.S. newspapers spanning over 10,000 papers in over a century. Uh, State-of-the-art natural language processing can be applied to headlines, articles, captions, etc., to create a variety of data for downstream analyses. Okay, so this was like the start of this project um, back in 2019. Put a newspaper into Google Cloud Vision, State-of-the-art OCR, and this is what it does. It reads the whole thing like it's a single column book. All the words are scrambled up. Uh, the headlines are mixed in with the captions and the ads and the articles. The only thing you can use this for is a keyword search, which is what most of the literature on historical newspapers uses. Um, but it's, you, you can't use modern natural language processing on this. Um, and so that was kind of the starting point and this project has really spanned like the past uh, four years, figuring out how do we process these data and how can we do it very cheaply at scale? Because nobody wants to give me money to do stuff. And so when I like, process data, I need to like uh, do it very cheaply. Um, and so first of all, we recognize the document layouts, um, uh, you know, using the methods that I already talked about with layout parser. And so you can see various example of newspaper layouts um, in this figure. And I should say this is newspapers from the United States, but you can easily apply this to newspapers and other languages and settings. And in fact, people have emailed us that they're already applying this pipeline um, to their own settings. Um, so we recognize the layouts, then we're going to Classify whether the content is, is, is legible because lots of stuff is not legible and we don't want to think we have it in our database if we don't. Um, then we're going to OCR it and then we're going to associate articles with their headlines. Um, and this yields the American Stories data set. This is with a lot of different collaborators over the have worked on this over the past four years, including Abhishek. Um, and um, in total, this data set recognizes 1.14 billion layout uh, objects. Um, on the newspaper page scans. Um, amongst those, there's uh, over 400 million articles and over 400 million headlines. We also have some captions, bylines, et cetera. Um, this is all on Hugging Face. We have tutorial notebooks. I, we know a lot of people aren't familiar with Hugging Face, uh, but Hugging Face is awesome. Um, there's a lot of great data on Hugging Face and we have a tutorial notebook, including kind of a very beginner tutorial notebook if it's totally new to you on how to go um, and download this data set and use it. And already people have emailed us who are using it for really exciting things. Um, so this data set mostly stops in 1920. This is Library of Congress's uh, public domain collection. Uh, we've also released headlines um, from uh, the later period, so up until the late 1970s when copyright law changes basically mean that like we just don't have access to historical newspapers. These are all off copyright newspapers. Um, all right, and 
in this data set, one thing that we do is we put together headlines for the same article, the same. So in US newspapers, newspapers largely get the content that they run from news wires like the Associated Press or United Press, um, but they write their own headlines. And so these are examples of uh, headlines um, for the same newspaper article uh, from the Associated Press, but the newspapers wrote their own headlines. And we pair those together in this data set. So you can see the headlines, um, but you can also see paired data as different ways of saying the same thing, you know, which is really useful for training and deep learning models as well. Um, this is just a fun example. Some people say, why do, you, why do we need this data? We already have the entire internet. Like, why would you need this data for to train? Um, deep neural models. Um, and um, Abhishek found these examples um, of like, what's the closest match in various different web corpuses that are often used to train large language models compared to in our headlines data set. And some of this is pretty amusing, um, but I'll, I'll just leave you with that. Um, all right, so once we have those data sets, we can use deep learning to analyze their content. We can use it for retrieval from a database with hundreds of millions of articles. You know, so when we finish digitizing this, it's like, okay, we have 900 million texts, like now what? <laughs> you need to use deep learning to retrieve. Um, we can do classification. Uh, we can detect the reproduction of content, which is important. We can detect the biggest stories on the most widely reproduced images. Um, we can recognize and disambiguate named entities like people and locations, so Wikipedia, et cetera. Um, so this is an example of classification that I had a couple of awesome undergrad RAs work on um, over the summer. Um, and so here you see, again, these are headlines about the same article, uh, but they vary in how sensational they are about Joseph McCarthy and how pro-McCarthy they are. It's kind of mind blowing. Um, and this gives us a what you know, this is related to um, some projects we're thinking about, about how the um, industrial organization of news markets influences things like sensationalism um, and journalistic practices. Um, and so you do this all with a classifier head. Um, we've also tracked reproduced content. This is uh, work with Emily Silcock, Luca de Amigo Wong, who's an undergrad here at Harvard and uh, Jingling Yang. Um, who was an undergrad RA initially as well. Um, and so reproduced content is really important in US newspapers uh, for creating a shared identity. I won't go into that in too much detail, but essentially what we do is to train a model to detect which articles come from the same source in a context that's full of abridgment and OCR error. So this text is harder than you think. We show using traditional methods, they don't do particularly well. Um, and so we apply it to these newspapers and also to some other settings. We create our own data for training. Um, uh, the neural methods, the closer to 100 you are, the better. And these just greatly outperform the non-neural methods and saying, does this news article come from the same underlying source? And what, I, what really like blows my mind about this um, is just how computationally efficient this is. So we wanted to take 10 million articles and say, which of these articles come from the same source? Um, this requires making, you know, we have to embed the 10 million articles. So we put them through a large language model to get vector representations for them. And then we have to make 10 to the 14th exact vector calculations. You can do that with a library called Facebook AI Similarity Search on a single GPU card in a few hours. Um, and so just the extent to which you can scale things if you have the right model, uh, with deep learning is kind of mind blowing. You know, I should say also in processing the um, newspaper data, we did that all on Microsoft Azure using 2000 virtual CPUs in parallel. Um, and so again, I don't have 2000 CPUs in my office, but cloud compute makes that possible. So it's just kind of mind blowing what's possible um, with modern compute, but you do need the right models. So we used efficient OCR um, to digitize our newspapers because the only other comparable open source solution, which was the transformer OCR I showed you, it took 50 times as long. And OCR was most of our compute budget. I had $60,000 grant uh, to digitize 20 million newspaper scans, it would have been 50 times more expensive than with that other OCR architecture. So there are efficient models out there. Um, you can do these calculations on academic budgets. Um, there's other stuff that's more costly, but I think like the bottom line is just the scale at which you can do things is kind of mind blowing to me. Okay, similar model. What are the biggest stories of the year? 
We would like to know that, but we have no idea ex ante what they are. So we custom trained our own language model, and I won't go into exactly how we did that, but we custom trained our own language model, again, to take articles about the same story and give them similar representations. And then we clustered, these are the biggest stories of the year in US newspapers from the 1880s um, uh, to 1920. And there were some things we expected here and some things that were pretty interesting. You see lots of stories about strikes. Again, there's nothing inherently limited to being in English with this. You could do this in a variety of settings. Um, most reproduced images. So you might see Melissa like, I thought you were sort of a development economist. <laughs> like, what are you doing uh, working with all these US newspapers? Well, our additional motivation um, was we were really interested in, in processing the images and seeing if certain iconic images change the attitudes of Americans towards um, civilian casualties um, in war and towards foreign intervention more generally. Um, and so to look at that question, um, we developed a very similar pipeline to the one we use to detect reproduced articles, except we're working with images and not text. But again, deep learning, it's kind of a very similar model. We trained it in a similar way um, to, to figure out what the most reproduced images of the year are. And I have to give you guys a few fun examples. So this is in the category of duh. You know, um, the most reproduced images, 1967, 1969, had to do with the Apollo program, right? Um, that's not surprising. You didn't need a deep learning model to tell us that, but the fact that we do detect that is, you know, amongst our other evaluations, it gives you confidence um, in the models. Um, another thing we saw is that there was a lot of interest in uh, showing violence and progress. Like on the left was a case where during a trial, um, the defendant took the judge in the courtroom hostage and a photographer caught that. This is an attack on a Russian premier in Canada. Um, plane crashes were clearly on the minds of people um, in this period. They also top out amongst the top five most reproduced images. Um, but then there's also a question of like, what did we not see? Like I will give a trigger warning about uh, showing, showing graphic images. Well, um, and so these were a couple of the images that we were interested in. You read a lot of content. This is the napalm girl image of this, this girl who was burned by napalm running uh, away. Um, from the bomb that, that this was um, you know, pivotal and uh, changing people's attitudes towards the Vietnam War, changing attitudes towards civilian casualties um, in conflicts, kind of similarly for this, um, this photo on the left. Um, people would like selectively say, oh, and it ran in this newspaper and this newspaper. It turns out that when you look systematically um, not many newspapers publish this napalm girl image. We think at the end, they didn't really like the frontal nudity in it, and it just wasn't very widely reproduced. The New York Times did put it below the fold, and maybe you think the New York Times is really important. And so we did an event study of stock market prices of defense contractors and specifically of Dow chemicals who made napalm. And you also see virtually no effect. It turns out that when you go to like Google Ingram data, you see that the mention of the this image and the, the girl that's in this image, it really picks up in the 1990s on when this woman started an, a charity to advocate for this. And it became very prominent much later on, like not at the time. And this has raised a lot of fascinating questions about historical memory and how you have this just, you know, we've seen firsthand this massive repository of information uh, from the past and you choose particular things based on your present circumstances that sort of speak to you at the time. Okay, we've also recognized entities, we're disambiguating them. I won't go into that because I wanna quickly use the last five minutes <laughs> to talk about solving computational problems. Um, and so I'm just gonna mention this, this very briefly. Um, and so this is another area, I think this is gonna grow hugely in economics over the next few years. I already have a couple of students who are working on various things. It's an area that I'm interested in as well. Um, and so sometimes as economists, we have difficult, like empty hard problems that we would like to solve. Uh, we wanna uh, upgrade a transportation network, et cetera. Um, and the tools for these methods um, in the deep learning space are graph neural networks and reinforcement learning. Um, so I know I'm throwing out more new terms for you guys, but let me say briefly what I mean. A graph neural network processes data that are structured as graphs, mapping the graph inputs into an embedding or a vector space. So it's just like, you know, with NLP, we map text into a vector space. 
Um, you know, with uh, computer vision, we map images, pixels from images into a vector space. You can do the same thing with graphs. And that's what graph neural networks do. They map graphs into a vector space. And so the, the embeddings or the vectors in this space uh, represent, they can represent an entire graph, they can represent a node or an edge from a graph, you know, depending on what you've trained the model to do. And each uh, node in that um, GNN aggregates information from its neighbors and possibly from its own previous state using learnable parameters. And again, you can do this over multiple layers, much like you can have a, a deep network to learn text. These, done, these are not as deep as that, um, but they, they have multiple layers. So by mapping the discrete structure of a graph into a continuous space, GNNs allow for the application of various machine learning techniques, such as clustering, classification, regression on graph structure data, right? So you can essentially think of a neural network as something that maps you know, data into a vector space, no different with GNNs. Um, GNNs do not make MP-hard problems solvable in polynomial time, but they can provide approximate solutions to certain MP-hard problems much, much, much more efficiently than traditional algorithms. Um, they can be trained on large data sets to learn patterns inherent in graph problems more generally. Okay, so once trained, a GNN uh, may be able to generalize and provide fast predictions for new unseen graphs. Um, traditional algorithms might need to solve the problem from scratch every single time, say when you're doing comparative statics, um, whereas um, uh, that's not necessarily the case with GNNs. Um, centrally, GNNs can be paralyzed on GPUs, which makes them much, much more suitable for large-scale problems than the traditional less scalable algorithms. Okay, oftentimes GNNs in this context are combined with reinforcement learning. So in economics, typically our our optimization problems involve both some kind of structured data that's represented by a graph and sequential decision-making. So in these contexts, it makes sense to combine GNNs with reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is another area of deep learning where an agent learns to make decisions by taking actions to maximize the cumulative reward. Um, and the agent interacts with the system, in this case, that's represented by the graph, observes outcomes and adjusts its actions based on the rewards. So in the deep learning space, typically reinforcement has been used in things like robotics, um, but just think of this as like, you know, an economic agent who's getting rewards and it kind of meshes nicely with economics. Combining GNNs and reinforcement learning allows the researcher to model complex structured data with GNNs and dynamics with reinforcement learning. GNNs capture the current state of the problem and reinforcement learning is employed to decide the next action. Um, these models can be trained end to end, uh, which is another advantage. So I'm just gonna give a demo example. Okay, we have a grid that, and the, there's population located at the nodes of the grid and the edges connecting those nodes are roads. Um, and we want to choose which roads to upgrade. So this is a problem like I'm grateful to Gabriel Krendler for suggesting, and it's a simplified problem of it, uh, from a paper in Econometrica. So it's clearly significantly simplified, um, but um, that allows us to kind of make a demo notebook that people can easily play around with. So this is an example. So these nodes are population. Um, you can upgrade 25% of the edges connecting these nodes, and the graph neural network will choose to upgrade the ones in red. Um, and so the first thing to note about this problem is computing an exact uh, solution is order n squared factorial. Like an n squared factorial is worse than exponential. So when it gets much beyond like six by six uh, graph, there's no way that you're gonna compute the exact solution. So that's just out the window. You're not computing the, the exact solution in any real world problem ever. You're gonna use approximate algorithms and we do compare GNNs plus reinforcement learning, um, which we implement so, something called the graph environment package with uh, Greedy Solver and Metropolis Hastings, which are commonly used. And the punchline, um, I, I, I won't get into solving it, but the punchline um, is that all three of the kind of approximate solutions uh, provide similar solutions, but the GNNs plus reinforcement learning are way faster. So if you do a 20 by 20 grid, and you do that 120 times to compute comparative statics. Um, GNN plus reinforcement learning is an order of magnitude faster than Metropolis Hastings and multiple orders of magnitude better than the greedy algorithm. And so I think there's still a lot of work done to incorporate these into economics problems. There's huge literatures uh, in now in like drug discovery and chemistry, like chemistry and molecular biology using them that have had a lot of success. 
um, you know, they're just coming into economics. We have to see like how they work, when they work for our problems. But I think that they are super promising for taking computational problems that would just be computationally infeasible to get an approximate <coughs> solution with the traditional algorithms and making, um, making it possible for people who do computational modeling and economics to study much, much larger and more realistic problems. Okay, so just to conclude, deep learning provides powerful tools for processing unstructured economic data, uh, creating robust representations for downstream analyses, becoming familiar with deep learning methods, how they apply to economics and how they can be implemented and debugged can entail significant startup costs. And in my group, we've worked really hard uh, to, to lower those costs by providing open source packages, by providing the knowledge base. Um, you can find that knowledge base on my website. We're also in the process of constructing a new website, um, econDL. Um, and that will have also tutorial notebooks for the various examples that I've shown you in this lecture, um, as well as the knowledge base link from there. Not all the tutorial notebooks are up yet, but they will be up in the near future. Um, so there's a lot of other resources for people who would like to learn more. Um, and thank you so much.